And now I'd like to introduce Kelsey Brendel, our interim chair from SPEDPAC to join us. Kelsey. Thank you so much, Joshi, and everyone joining us tonight and all the interpreters. We're so excited to get this meeting going. And as many of you know, you're here to listen to a special presentation this evening on family and guardian rights in special education. Um, I'm Kelsey Brendel, as Joshi mentioned, I'm the interim chair of SPEDPAC. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so I wanna tell you a little bit for those of you who are new about who we are, what we do, and why it should matter to you as you continue to advocate for your child um, in the Boston Public Schools. And then we'll get right into a couple of announcements and of course our presentation. Um, but first and foremost, more about us and what we do. If you're here for the first time, welcome. We hope this will be the first of many times we see you. SPEDPAC is the acronym that stands for the Special Education Parent Advisory Council. And we are here first and foremost to amplify your voice. The most important voice is your voice as parents and guardians of students with disabilities in Boston Public Schools. We're here to offer information, resources, support, um, evenings and presentations like this. We have many general meetings. You can learn all about the calendar and what's coming up and what's been behind us on the website. But you know, the information and presentations are meant to support uh, the needs and questions you have as families navigating the Boston Public Schools with a child with a disability. Um, and we also support and work closely to advise Boston Public Schools on the matters that affect your student. What matters to you matters to us and matters to them. So we work closely with them on that. And most importantly, want to remind everyone here tonight that this is your forum. This forum belongs to you and we are here for you, for your questions, for concerns that come up tonight or later. Um, we will get to them and always interested to hear your comments, inquiries, what we could do better, what we can improve on. We want to hear from you um, any and all times. So please don't hesitate to get in touch, get involved and use your voice. Um, lastly, I say to everyone, because I myself as a parent with a young child with multiple disabilities, I remember thinking very early on in my own personal journey that surely I was the only one that had you know, the simple questions I had and afraid to ask them, or as time went on, the more complicated questions, afraid to ask those two, never, never be afraid to do that. I can guarantee you, your question belongs to lots of other people who are also eager to ask it. So you're doing everyone a favor by providing inquiry and again, using your voice as loudly as you can. And we're here to help you do that. I mentioned tonight's presentation is about knowing your rights and uh, guiding you and advocating for your child. Your rights as a parent or a guardian are many under state and federal law. So it's good to be really aware of them before you ever need to assert them. Hopefully that, that won't have to be terribly often, but this is a really great place to launch um, a conversation and an inquiry about what those mean for your family and your child. Now on to some quick announcements so we can get right to the presentation, um, but we have a couple of new updates related to our board that I wanted to share. Um, the first is that a few weeks ago, many of you may know um, our chair, Jack Sinnott, stepped back uh, as board chair to tend to some health and family concerns. Um, and we really wish him the very best and hope uh, for his wellness, of course. But in light of that, I wanna highlight to all of our members that there are a number of openings and vacancies on our board for various board positions. Um, if you have interest in this, and we really hope you do, I mentioned this is your forum, and it's your forum because we want your voices to be reflected in this forum as we go forward in the work. So if you have interest um, in any of the board positions, and we will discuss it at greater length in our newsletter, which I'm hoping you'll stay tuned for in the next couple of days, what the exact roles or responsibilities and commitment is for each of the roles so that you can better decide what might be suited for you or someone you know. But if you do have interest in one of them, please, please email us. The details about how to do that are in the chat. We'll repeat it over and over again. Um, and if there is interest, 
uh, from our general membership and sure hope there is, then we will go ahead and organize a special election to be held on February 29th, which is also the date of our next general meeting. So something much like this. And we would just ask that you get those email inquiries into us by the 18th so that again, we can gauge interest Hope there's a lot of it, and then we'll have a few days to organize the special election so that it can reach the broadest number of people and possible participants that we possibly can. So that's that's my announcement about, about elections. Really hope you will consider it and think about all the talented people you know, um, talk to them about it more, and again, send us an email. Also, I'm always here as your interim chair to answer any questions you have about those positions or the responsibilities, but as I said, they'll be further discussed in the newsletter as well. Um, if we don't get any interest, uh, which was the case sadly in October, if we don't get those email inquiries about running for a particular position or being interested in one, we won't have the special election because when we did that before, we ended up spending a lot of time without any inquiries and we want that time obviously to belong to you. So that's just another plug for please, please send your emails our way and we will be in touch with you about the next step, but you can mark that on your calendar for the 29th as the next general meeting. Um, next is that we are, let's see, I mentioned our newsletter. Oh, obviously our featured speaker tonight, uh, the Federation for Children with Special Needs will be giving our presentation. We're really thrilled and grateful that they could come and be with us tonight. I'll let you, I mean, I'll let them tell, tell you more about what they do and how they can also help all of our families and students in that advocacy work. Um, so they will do a fine job at explaining what their work is about. And with that said, I'd love to get on to the program and know that at the end, if we have time, we will always make time for questions. So feel free to ask them in the chat, raise your hand at the end. We'll sort of conduct how that can go given how much time we have left. Um, and I would just give my two reminders uh, to speak slowly for our presenters. And if you are asking a question later as a member, we always welcome it. I just gently remind people that this is a public forum. You know, the meeting is recorded and it will be posted. So use, you know, your personal discretion about giving lots of details about your family or your child. Um, and lastly, we are really lucky to be joined by uh, our BPS community as well so that they can help to support in questions that are more specific in nature. You'll see them in the chat as well. Um, so pay attention to that. So without further ado, uh, again, I turn things over to the Federation for Children with Special Needs. And we have Anne Tang, who's our senior trainer and family engagement manager, who will be part of that presentation tonight, joined by Megan Chapman, family partner specialist, and Andrea Parker, who is a project director and from Boston Public Schools to help again support with more specific questions in the chat, Cassandra Krishlow, who is an assistant director of early childhood is also here. So that's certainly more than enough information to digest. So let's get to the main part of the show. And lastly, I leave you with um, being grateful that you're here and reminding you that while we, while we can't solve everything, we can always work to um, make better a little something. So we're here for each other and hope you enjoy the presentation this evening. Stay tuned for questions afterwards. Thank you so much. With that, I'll turn it over, I suppose, to Anne and the Federation. Thanks, thank Kelsey. you so much, Kelsey. Um, yeah, thank you for having us. We are very happy to be here today. And while I will be sharing the presentation, Megan will be speaking. So please hold while I do that. Andrea, can you see the presentation? Yes. I'm sure it's live. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to actually start with the second slide, if that's okay. Great. This is Megan speaking. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting us to join you tonight. 
There we go. The Federation for Children with Special Needs always welcomes an opportunity to meet with members of the Boston Spend Pack. Um, and I want to say thank you to Kelsey. And while I agreed with all, all the points you made, I just wanted to highlight that we also agree that um, you know any and all comments are welcome and needed and feedback always. We also are always looking to improve. So hopefully we'll hear from you tonight and hopefully we'll hear from you moving forward also because here is our information, our contact information here on the slide. Um, I wonder if any of you were here last year when we visited, um, we came to ask for your thoughts about which topics would be most important to highlight in the new family guide for students with disabilities. Maybe you remember, which that's now live. It's live in 10 languages. I'll add a link in the chat for that as well. Um, more than 400 families answered that survey and it was offered in all of the languages that are represented here tonight. Thank you to anyone here tonight who may time to participate in that. Um, I just wanna take a moment to introduce the team here tonight. We work together at the Federation. I'm Megan Chapman, Family Partnership Specialist. I work with family-led groups like Special Education Parent Advisory Councils and also English Learner Parent Advisory Councils. It's uh, our goal is to help them improve their outreach to include all families, improve communication with members and with the district, and to provide resources that can help them do their important work of advocating for families on a systemic level. I'm also a current member of the CPAC in my town and a former CPAC co-chair. Ann Tang is a new addition to the Federation. She's a senior trainer, family engagement manager with the Federation. Her work has a focus on supporting school districts to better meet the needs of newcomer families who have immigrated to the United States in the past two years. And Andrea Parker is the project director of our special education surrogate parent work. And since she'll be explaining more about that in just a few minutes, I don't want to give anything away. Next up. So for those of you who may be meeting us for the first time, the Federation for Children with Special Needs, also known as FCSN, or the Federation, I'd like to just take a moment to introduce the organization to you. We will also add a link to our website in the chat because the Federation is a collection of projects aimed at supporting students with disabilities and multicultural and multilingual students and students with healthcare needs and their families. So their families can advocate for what their students need. Most of our staff is multilingual and any of our services can be provided to anyone with the help of an interpreter, which the Federation would supply. Most people are familiar with our one-to-one -one supports for families through our information line and also our group supports through workshops and our work with CPACs um, where we provide training and support. But we can also help families apply for mass health to gather information on schools around the state so you can decide what type of school is best for your student. And that includes special education schools and vocational technical schools, charter schools, all schools. And there's much more, um, yeah. but we hope you'll visit our website and reach out to us with questions that you might have. So why do we offer these free services? And they are free. Um, well, our history is on our website. Again, that link is in the chat, but I'll sum it up by saying that the people who founded the Federation were family members of students with disabilities, just like you. And they got together to support one another to address systemic issues in the school system, just like you. And together with attorneys and educators and legislators, they designed, supported, and lobbied for a bill that became the special education law in Massachusetts. That's known as chapter 766. That law was one of the models for the federal laws that followed, including one you're familiar with, probably, 
the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA. Well, those parents then lobbied the federal government who funded FCSN to be the first parent training and information center in the United States. And now there are approximately 100 around the country. Every state has at least one. We are all focused on helping parents learn the laws that apply to their student, know their rights, and join with other families to make change. So I also wanna pause for a moment to say that we use parent, guardian, family, caregiver, interchangeably. To us, they mean the same thing. It's the people who care for a student. So next we're going to meet Andrea Parker, who will tell you about an exciting way to take the knowledge and experience you already have to help some of our most vulnerable students. Ann Tang will then let you know about some important workshops and events that might be useful to you that are coming up. Then I will walk us through the different ways to resolve disagreements between you and the school district. And finally, we'll have some time for questions and answers. Next slide. Thanks so much, Megan. My name is Andrea Parker. I am first and foremost a parent. I have two children on 504 plans, ages uh, 16 and 12. We are a multicultural, multilingual family. And it is really on my honor to be here with you all tonight. I wanna just double click on something that both um, Megan and our other hosts said this morning that we are here to help you this evening. But we're also here to empower those even more vulnerable than ourselves. So you might be here on behalf of your own child or a child you care for. And there are also 1,000 and more scholars who have experienced removal from their homes and have been placed in congregate care, therapeutic, or group homes. Or they are homeless and are already eligible or in the process of eligibility for special education services. So who is gonna sit at the table at the IEP meeting with these kiddos, especially when they're over the age 13 and they attend their own meetings, their own meetings. So their circumstances make them eligible for somebody like you or someone who maybe you know a volunteer, which the federal legislation refers to as a special education surrogate parent. While the term is slightly misleading, what it refers to is the educational decision maker who has the rights and the responsibility to observe the student, request evaluations, request records, attend IEP meetings, NBID meetings, best interest determination meetings, and make educational decisions for and with the child they represent. Do you know someone who might be eligible? You can make a referral at the link that I will drop in the chat. Do you have about an hour a week or 40 hours per year to volunteer in this role? Or do you know somebody who might be a great fit we look for social workers, we look for educators, retired special education administrators. It's not necessary to have any experience or knowledge. We will train and support you. So we'll also drop the link in the chat to apply. And with your permission, I'd like to share two very short videos, which will both within both be about three minutes. And before I do that, also just to ground ourselves in the definition 
that our state has across the coalitions of social services for family engagement. And that is the elimination of poverty, oppression, and disadvantage. That's obviously a visionary statement. It's a journey. And we hope to get there together with you. A moment to share the screen and the sound. Are you all seeing a video? Yes. Yeah. Great. Uh, Andrea, before you continue, up for these. yes. Sorry, we have our Somali interpreter in the English channel. I just want to make sure that you're able to join the Somali channel. All right, you could go on. Thank you. So I'm going to put my volume up. Let me know in the chat if it's not audible. The special education surrogate parent program with the Federation. And I had in mind those students that I worked with for so many years, but I also had in mind my siblings. And I wanted to continue to utilize my skills that I had as a special ed teacher and also as a special ed administrator. And they immediately connected me with my first student, who was Elijah. So the first thing that struck me about Elijah is that he is an intelligent, young man with goals and dreams and aspirations for the future. But the district was not supporting him to the level that they should have been. And so it started off with, Elijah, share with me what your goals are. And I was just astounded that he had so many. He knew exactly what he wanted to do. He wants to go to Berkeley College of Music. And so that immediately became a priority in terms of how can we strengthen his educational pathway? I really enjoyed working with, with Edith a lot. I really like how like she pushes for like what I want and what I need. She'll sit there and listen. She'll be like, oh, this is what you want. All right, we're going to push for that. We're going to make that happen. And I really like that. I feel like she's taught me how to advocate for myself. Having an advocate has helped me advocate for things that are better for me than for what people think that's better for me. And for those who are considering joining, and I would say come, there's orientation, there's training, there's support there's mentoring. So if you don't think you have the skills, we will help you build those skills. And what you're doing is you are creating a pathway for a young person to really build a future for him or herself. In any way, I encourage you, it will be rewarding to yourself, but more importantly, to a young person in the society. Yeah, dude, I feel like people should uh, support the Federation because you know, I'm, I'm somebody who benefits from it and I think that's helped me a lot, it's helped me grow and um, become better. Like I said before, advocacy, I really like that. I like that I had somebody on my side in my corner advocating for what I need and what I want. All right. And one more video that's also quite short. Just stop share there. And I just, as I'm sharing these, I wanna make sure we, we know you are all busy and that you're probably already stretched very thin. So we share this as an opportunity. Our orientation is free, that if you apply, you're under no obligation to continue in the volunteer um, pool. Um, it, it, uh, we do actually get a lot of families who have, who are, you know, beyond kind of supporting their own children and looking for another opportunity to support others that are that are in a more vulnerable situation. Give me one more second here. Sure. Andrea? Yep. Do you mind? I loved that video. Is it okay if we stop with that one only because um, I'm realizing yep. just looking at the time, that was perfect though. I love that video. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will drop the links in the chat to both make a referral for any student who you might know and also to become a volunteer. Thank, Thank you. you.
that this is Megan. Um, so uh, we're just going to look at one more thing because because we can't cover everything in basic rights. And she's going to point out a few workshops that are coming up, and then we're going to dive into. Um, Thank you, Megan. Please hold while I reshare my screen. Uh, before you begin, our Somali interpreter raised their hand. Leila, do you need help with anything? Um, to our Haitian Creole speaking interpreter and our Somali interpreter, just please be sure to join your channels. Uh, I have heard you in the English channel, so just want to make sure that families are able to access your channel for tonight's interpretation. Thank you. Sorry, Anne and Megan, you could go on. No worries. Thank you. This is Anne. Tonight's presentation is a brief and focused one on how to address concerns with existing IEPs or 504 plans. But we host several workshops every week that may be useful to you. All of our workshops are free. If you require interpretation, we are happy to accommodate you. We only ask that you please register and make your request as early as possible. We have a calendar of events that you can subscribe to on our website, and we will add the link to the chat. There is also a QR code on this slide to the right, which also links you directly to our events calendar. Since some of you may be new to the special education process or have specific needs that we may not cover tonight, we want to be sure you know that our free online workshops are open to everybody. They are designed to empower caregivers with information and inspiration. Some workshops you may be most interested in include our basic rights series. These are three presentations. There are three presentations in these series. First, evaluation and eligibility, which covers the process leading up to the district, sending you your first IEP and the three-year eligibility process. We hosted one of these earlier this week, and please check our calendar for dates in February. We update the calendar at least once a week. Second, understanding the IEP covers what to know about IEPs and how to seek resolution to issues. Our next workshop on this topic is next Wednesday night. Third, transition planning is about the special issues that need to be addressed when students are between the ages of 14 and 22. We encourage parents to begin thinking about transition long before then. And that workshop is being presented next Monday night. Lastly, Effective Communication is a free workshop that we offer and encourage all families to attend. Even if you think you are the strongest communicator, there seems to be always something useful to take away from this workshop. It is also being offered next Monday. We will be skipping this slide, um, but please refer to our website if you'd like to learn more about our visions of community conference. This is Megan speaking. Thanks, Anne and Andrea. Um, although this is not a presentation on the entire special education process, this slide can be useful for caregivers who are new to special education. Honestly, it can be useful for caregivers at any stage in the process. We've included it because you will be emailed the slides and for more information, please contact the Federation for one-to-one -one support or to register to attend the workshop called Basic Rights, Evaluation and Eligibility. Next slide. Hmm. I can't see the body of that slide, okay. Well, this slide is an overview of topics of, oh, it's appearing. It's an overview of topics we dive deeper into in our free workshop named Basic Rights, Understanding the IEP. There are, um, if there are any topics in the parent rights list on the left that you are unfamiliar with, we invite you to attend and learn more. These are tools that can help you as your child's advocate. 
So tonight, we will be focusing on the right-hand column, procedural safeguards, problem resolution system, mediation, facilitated IEP meetings, BSEA hearing, BSEA resolution meeting, and the Office of Civil Rights. During our time for questions, we can also answer questions about these parent rights topics as we have time. So please feel free to add your questions in the chat at any time. Next slide. So you also find out about options um, that we'll be discussing tonight in your copy of the parent's notice of procedural safeguards. School districts must provide a copy of this document once per year to all families of eligible students with disabilities. It describes your rights in the special education process, including your options to reject an IEP in part or fully, and who to contact for different types of resolution to problems in the process. This document is available in 20 languages, and we will add a link for you in the chat. Next slide. When there is a disagreement among members of a 504 or IEP team, the first step FCSN encourages is to heal the rift. Your student will likely need support from this team or one like it for their entire time in school. So it's important to learn to work within the system in a healthy way that can improve the relationship and improve the system. So why is effective communication important? Well, it's the best way to work with the school for the benefit of your student. Many of us have probably heard the saying, you catch more flies with honey than vinegar. It's human nature to do more for people who appreciate your effort. So how can you tell if effective communication is missing in your 504 or IEP team? If you answer no to any of these questions, communication may need to be improved. First, do you trust your teammates? And do they trust you? Do you receive information from your teammates when you need it? And do they receive information from you when they need it? Number three, do you hear about problems when they are small before they become complicated? And do you accept and build on your teammates' ideas and input or do you resist them? And finally, do they accept and build on your ideas and input or do they resist them? So if you answered no to any of those, we encourage you to attend that free workshop named Effective Communication. Because yes, even if you do not think the problem is with your communication, part of being a family leader is leading from any seat and modeling great behavior. In this workshop, we talk about assertiveness as a healthy way of communicating and practice active listening skills. FCSN also works with districts directly to help them build their capacity for being uh, working better with families, just to acknowledge that. But when the first step, when there is a disagreement, is to work on relationship building through effective communication. Next slide. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education is known as DESI. DESI runs the problem resolution system known as PRS. So what kind of problems can we bring to the problem resolution system? Most often, PRS is used for compliance issues. You can file a complaint for an issue that happened less than one year ago if it's for any of these issues. One, you believe the IEP process laws are not being followed correctly. So the process, you feel like the process is flawed and that's a problem and causing a problem for your student. Two, you think the district is not providing the services agreed to in the IEP. For example, your service grid might say your student is supposed to receive um, social skills three times a week for 45 minutes. But when you check with your child, you hear that they're only receiving services once a week. So that's not, that, that would be you understanding that there's a lack of compliance with the IEP. 
or you think the district is not providing educational services to your child that all students are meant to have access to. So if there's something that all students have access to, your student, because of their disability, doesn't have access, that could also be something that could be filed with the PRS. The PRS is not the place to ask for help with a disagreement about whether a service should be included in an IP or how often it should be included and not for making placement decisions. So if you disagree with the placement decision, that's not an issue for PRS. Also, PRS is not the fastest way to resolve an issue. So DESE really um, encourages people to contact their school district personnel, for example, the principal, the superintendent of schools, the administrator of special education. For all of you, that would be the coordinator in your school and then up to the regional um, assistant director. First, resolve, try to resolve the problem within the school district first. But through its problem resolution system, DESE handles complaints that allege a school or a district is not meeting legal requirements for education. Anyone, including parents, students, educators, community members, CPACs, and agency representatives may contact the PRS office for assistance. And again, we'll add that link and phone number in the chat for you to have access to. So what happens? when you contact PRS. You'll describe your concern. The PRS representative will let you know if that type of concern is one that PRS can address. If it is, they will ask you if you've exhausted all the ways you can to resolve this on your own. They will want to know if you notify the special education coordinator in your school, and the assistant director for your region, for example. Then they will ask you to sign a document that summarizes your concerns so PRS complaints are not anonymous. And then they will contact the district directly to gather information. And if the district is out of compliance with the IEP or 504 plan or the IEP or 504 plan development process, they will seek to work with the district to resolve the issue. As a side note, DESE reviews PRS complaints before beginning their six year program review of each school district. And that helps them to notice if there are any patterns of complaints that may indicate systemic issues that need to be addressed. All right, looking at the alternate dispute resolution options under the Bureau of Special Education Appeals. We have four categories we're going to look at. Facilitated team meetings are first. These meetings are run exactly the same, they would, same way they would be if the facilitator was not present, or you can request that the facilitator lead the meeting. This facilitator is a neutral party they will not take sides. They are not there to help make a decision, um, but their role is to navigate through any unhealthy communications so the team can focus on the needs of the child. With the goal being to develop an IEP or a 504 plan that everyone can agree on. So you or the school district can request a facilitated meeting anytime. We will add a link in the chat where you can find out more about facilitated team meetings. You or the school can also request a mediation. This is a voluntary and confidential process. I'm gonna explain what both of those points really mean. So the mediator is meant to, again, be impartial. Their role is to listen to both sides and try to help clarify what each side is trying to communicate. They will try to identify any underlying concerns, discuss options, and help both sides to collaborate to address the needs of the student. If an agreement is reached, 
it's put into writing and signed by both sides. Now, here's what we mean by voluntary. You are allowed to say you do not want to be part of the mediation if the district requests it. And the district can also decline if you request mediation. When we say it's confidential, any offers made to you in mediation by the school district cannot be entered into evidence at a BSEA hearing if it wasn't offered at another time involved outside of mediation. And the mediator cannot be called as a witness at a BSEA hearing. And we'll add a link in the chat where you can find out more about and request mediation. BSEA hearings. People hear a lot about them. Um, I'm sure I'm happy to answer questions if there's anything um, larger about this that you want to talk about, but to sum up what they are, a parent or the school district may file a written request for a due process hearing with the Bureau of Special Education Appeals. Hearings are used to resolve disagreements about the identification, evaluation, educational placement, or provision of a free, appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. That is a mouthful. Um, free, appropriate public education. We also call that FAPE. And that's if it's being delivered to a child who needs or is suspected of needing special education and related services. The BSEA hearing officer is not a judge, it's an attorney. They conduct a formal hearing with expert witnesses. The school district is typically represented by an attorney. Families can have representation. It is not required. Um, actually, at our upcoming conference, there's an excellent session, Dan Heflin from Houghton and Crabtree Law Offices, and he gives a summary of all the case law from this past year um, that's relevant, and he will cover how many parents, how many cases went to hear him, and how many were um, found in for families versus school districts. In general, this is a general statement, tends to lean towards schools, but not dramatically. What's a dramatic split? I mean, having heard Dan talk about this for a few years in a row now, the big split and what makes a difference in hearings is who brings the hearing is then responsible for proving the case. So if a parent files, they are responsible for proving that they are so you need to have, as a family, expert witnesses that are of equal caliber to the experts the school brings. So family, families who only say it's my opinion are the ones that don't generally win. If you have expert opinions um, that can have a discussion, you're then on equal footing, which is at least at a starting place. That's a generalization. It is not legal advice, but it's just a, some guidance for thinking about hearings and whether or not you have representation. Resolution meeting, so, um, and believe me, school of attorneys do earn their money for creating a case that makes it equal to school districts and what they bring to the table so that it's not, again, not trying to make a case for representation or not. Resolution meetings, sometimes people are surprised by this. School districts must hold a resolution meeting within 15 calendar days of receiving notice that a parent requested a BSEA hearing. So after you file, whether it's you, your attorney, your advocate, after you file, the school district is required to meet with you again. And what the attorney is looking for is how reasonable you are. And they are looking for how reasonable you have been through the entire process. So from from when there became a problem till getting to hearing. They're always going to be looking for how reasonable the parents, the family, guardian, caregiver, representative is. 
Resolution meeting is an opportunity to resolve issues listed in the hearing request. The meeting must take place unless the parent and school district agree in writing not to have the meeting because they're going to use mediation or another settlement option. What are other settlement options? That could include a pre-hearing conference with the office, the hearing officer, that attorney I mentioned, who runs the actual hearing, or a settlement conference with the director of BSCA. Um, and these are typically available when the parties are represented by attorneys and not as often parties, um, just families representing themselves. Next slide. Okay, the Office of Civil Rights is a federal law enforcement agency responsible for guaranteeing that people are free from discrimination in education settings and other settings, but we're talking about education. They are, it's based on race, of discrimination would be based on race, color, national origin, including primary language, disability, age, religion, and sex, including pregnancy, sexual orientation, and gender identity. So if you have any concerns that your child is being, or you in the process of advocating for your child, being discriminated against because of any of those reasons, you can contact the OCR to discuss if your complaint may meet the standards of discrimination. So for OCR to investigate a complaint, the incident must not have happened more than six months before. So it has to be within the last 180 days. They have an online complaint form and we'll add a link in the chat to their questions and answers section, which includes a link to their complaint form, but it's more informative than just the complaint form. The OCR also investigates claims of retaliation. Um, this is important to understand retaliatory acts, which may include giving students failing grades, preventing students or parents from participating in school activities, and threatening expulsion against any individual who exercises his or her rights under Title IX. So any, any organization, including schools who receive federal funds are prohibited from intimidating, threatening, coercing, or discriminating against any person for the purpose of interfering with any of your uh, Title IX rights, which includes this the whole advocacy process, as long as we're reasonable. They also investigate claims of lack of accessibility. And you would think, you know, access for you know, ramps, bathrooms, the usual physical accessibility, but it also includes technology, such as websites. Um, they might lack alt text. They might not have screens that are uh, accessible. The way that the website's contrast of text on um, the background color might not be suitable for people with low vision, for example. And videos might not have captions. Things like that can also be filed with the OCR. But the OCR will also ask you if you have um, tried to exhaust, have tried to um, resolve this within the district first. Okay, um, if we're able to add links in the chat, I'm hoping we can fit, yes, Diane's able to. We're gonna add a link for an evaluation form for this um, presentation tonight, because in our work, we are grant funded, the way we keep everything free for families and for CPACs, and um, mostly for districts, <laughs> is that we have grants. And one of the goals of all of our grants is that we have to receive data on who attends and what they thought of our work. And, so you don't have to even like what we did. We just need the, the uh, evaluation so that we can uh, hopefully get a, the same grants the next year and continue funding. So um, Anne's put that link into the chat. Thank you very much for that. And now we're moved into uh, questions. It is time for questions. If you have any general questions for us tonight, happy to answer those. Um, in general, we usually say that if you have any questions specific to your child. So please contact the Federation's Information Center, but we do have folks here tonight, it sounds like who can maybe answer some of your questions beyond what we can do. So please feel free to bring questions. We'll add a link to our online form where you can request a call from one of our information specialists. 
and a phone number that you can use to call us directly. I'll put that in the chat. And I also want to remind you to bookmark, read, share, and use this family guide for students with disabilities that we created with input from 400 families, these surveys that were offered in the same 10 languages represented tonight. Everywhere we go in the state, people are in awe of this effort to make special education information accessible to so many families. And there's still more work to do. We, we update it every month. Nothing is perfect. And we invite you to give us feedback on the tool itself. We've included a link inside the tool to, so that everyone can give feedback at any time. And we are continually monitoring that and making improvements based on that feedback. Um, and if we really enjoy uh, keeping this up to date and keeping it alive with Boston Public School staff for you, the families. Wonderful. So. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Federation. Thank you for all for all making the, um, you know, what could have been a complex presentation, comprehensive and understandable and paced. So we really appreciate that. Um, and fortunately we do have some time for questions. So I think what we'll do is start at the beginning with a couple of live questions. And I just remind wow. everyone, again, um, speak clearly and slowly as much as you can um, for the interpreters and, as much as you can generalize a question, you know, that would be applicable to the greater audience. I think that would be the most helpful, but again, we're always help, you know, willing and able to follow up on a more personal level later, um, either through SPEDPAC, direct you to the district, or as you've heard, the Federation is more than thrilled to help as well. So let's start with uh, Jacenia Perez, hope I'm saying that right, ask you to unmute and ask your question. Thank you so much. So my question is, um, my child needs door to door transportation. And I, I've seen that in other districts, I didn't have a problem with it requesting it in the district like Fall River. But for some reason, I've been requesting the assistance from the district to see if they can give him door to door transportation based on his social and emotional need um, based on his needs, right? Um, how am I able to do that? Like I gave them a call to see if we can have a, a meeting um, to like, who do I contact if I, like I called the school, the school said that they were going to call me back, that they were going to set up a meeting so that we can discuss like the transportation part. And for me to be able to speak for my child, you know, speak up for my child as far as getting the, uh, you know, the services that he needs. But I haven't heard back from the school and it seems to be a huge problem. So, I mean, how do I reconvene the IEP team so that we can discuss the door-to-door -door transportation? Because they want to make sure that it's not of convenience, it's not something of convenience, and that it's something that he actually needs and he really does need that. Justinia, thank you for your question. It's a really good one. Um, Certainly the, the Federation can jump in if they think they have a, a good answer for this as well, but I would very much recommend for you so that we can follow up with you directly to put your name and contact information in the chat just so that we have it and can write it down. We will be sure that we direct you to someone in BPS who will follow up with you, if not immediately in the chat, certainly afterwards, and we will do the same. So um, please be sure you do that, You know your contact information or whatever you're comfortable with. Um, are there, are there uh, thoughts from the Federation on, on this particular question? I would direct, um, the lovely folks here from BPS also to maybe try to support and connect with Jacenia as well. I'm sure they're here on the chat and they will do that. Um, I'll just jump in really quickly to say that yes, this is a, a reasonable request, especially if there's, um, if it's, if it's disability related and it's required to keep the child safe and able to, uh, manage their social and emotional uh, levels that's perfectly reasonable to request i don't know if bps has any thoughts on uh, a process or something that they're that they would be looking for i would um i would reiterate we'll be sure um 
We will be sure, Jacenia, that we connect you with exactly the right person at BPS, probably in transportation or in the Office of Specialized Services. So I'll make sure that that happens. If again, you're comfortable putting um, your contact details in the chat so that we can direct you to exactly the right person. I hope that sounds helpful in the interim. Um, but yes, it's absolutely a reasonable request, concern, and we'll look into it. Um, it looks and like BPS responded in the chat and gave just in oh, some information. Perfect. Great. That's great. All right. Well, let's move on to the next question. I see, and then we'll we'll touch on a, pup, a couple more in the chat if we have time for that. Um, I see next is Rob Talevi. If I said that right, uh, Rob, go ahead with your question. You actually got that right in the first try. So, awesome. Oh, okay. um, so my my I, this is my first step back meeting. Um, so my two kids go to the Linden and one of my oldest son has a 504. Now, obviously I know there's been the discussions across the city regarding budget cuts around different schools. And one of those was um, our school is going to be going down from two to one social worker. And it's a K through eight school. And my concern is how can I ensure to protect my child's rights if, you know, we already have, as it is, the social workers are already bogged down and they put down, I put down for my 504, the 504 accommodation that he used to have regular meetings with the social worker and they switched it to as needed. So basically meaning if a situation is, or maybe they interpret it as, as needed. Um, it, it, it just, it, it, these are the types of things that kind of bother me. And it concerns me because you know, it should be concerning a lot of other parents because there's a lot of things that go on at home. There's a lot of things that are going on in these kids' heads. And um, I don't know, I'm just trying to find ways to like ensure that he has what he needs for support as well as for the other kids, advocating for the other kids, because I think this is a huge issue. Um, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just looking, I'm just kind of spouting off all my ideas at once that I don't know how to frame it, but um, what do you oh, guys? Rob, I, I, Kim Kelsey, is it okay if I jump in there? Yes, please do. Megan, this is um, Megan. Um, so Rob, I just wanted to make sure I understand. So what you're saying is that you're hearing about budget cuts and you're concerned um, that that might impact the services that your student, your child can receive um, and that you have already experienced a change to the service plan that perhaps you didn't agree to? Well, no, I mean, we asked that social worker uh, visits with the social worker be added in. My son's teacher had mentioned because she she's worked in special education for about 20 years. And she says he hasn't had a follow up with anybody since he because we actually switched him to a different classroom mm -hmm. um, because this last teacher wasn't really accommodating on special educational needs. So that was Again, it's I'm not sure if it was lost in translation, but mm -hmm. it's they basically told me because well, you might be easy to be going for an IEP. They said, well, you need to be clear, like weekly visits or hours because they'll just put him down as an as needed basis, which means they'll only see him if he throws an incident at school, gotcha. which I again, I, you know, what if there's those times where he has something that, like a blip or a bad week and then he's find other weeks so, it sounds like rob so it sounds like you're going you are going to be going through the process of the iep to, to have them evaluated for an iep which yep. is how you can get the really standardized you know it's in okay. a service grid it's in a plan um and with the 504 there might still be other routes then i'd love to hear it from other folks but um agreed christine that's where i was headed was budget cuts basically rob the funding can't there is nothing in the law that says unless the district doesn't have enough money yeah there's nothing, there's nothing that says that. So if because of any reason, including funding, a district says they cannot provide something, but it's been agreed to already um, because it's something that you need, that your child needs, then that's a compliance issue. So we were talking about like with PRS, et cetera, but again, you don't have to go to PRS. I would talk to your, your folks first and escalate it as okay. you need to, but they, there isn't anything in any law that says unless the district doesn't have money. Well, right. And that's the thing. They're like, well, we're still having one social worker, but I'm like, it's K through eight. That's a lot of kids. And 
it just it's if, yeah if you need more support. one-to-one support please you know your CPAC is Kelsey's right there and then also you know the, the federation for one-to-one support can definitely you know talk awesome. you through some things as well awesome thank you very much guys thank you Rob thanks a good question um I mean we'll just try to go certainly in order here I think I'm going to uh, see if Sarah who's kindly monitoring the chat can amplify one of the questions in the chat and then we'll get back and forth in the order that they're showing up. Sarah, can you ask that question of one of the families in the chat? Let's see. Sure if. All right, well, while we are, let's see, I think we're having a hard time unmuting Sarah. So let me get back to the next, uh, we'll, we'll circle back to the chat, no worries. Um, uh, Davina or Davina, did I get that right? I'm going to ask you to unmute and go ahead and ask your question. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay. So I'm. I'm. So my daughter has an IP. She was um, considered for an inclusion school. However they believe the inclusion school would help her rather than give her any other services. So now she's in an inclusion school um, and she's been there since January 3rd and I already have four meetings. Um, and this point, and right now it's to the point that I had a big meeting today, but everyone believes that my child is just lazy and she doesn't, she doesn't want to do the work. They. The, these people don't see the problem with my child. And I, so I want to know who can I talk to, to to get more services or maybe can they reevaluate her? Because this IP is from first grade. She's third grade and she can't even do a three digit math. And the teachers keep saying that she just lazy. She just needs to adjust. They don't see that she actually has a problem. So it's like, can I, can I call somebody to to see if I can update the evaluation, her IP, um, can they reevaluate her being in the inclusion school and put her like in a smaller class? What can I do for her? Hey, Davina, can I jump in again? It's Megan. Yeah. This is a great question. Um, so there's a couple of things. One, that evaluate that those those workshops we mentioned earlier. Um, I think they would be really important for you because as you go through this process, it would be great information for you to understand things like um, you have the right to request an independent evaluation. If you disagree, if anyone disagrees with the evaluation findings that the district um, uh, okay. comes up with, you can then say, I, I don't agree with this. You put it in writing. Don't just say it, put it in writing. And okay. email them or write it, however you want to deliver it to them, just keep copy. Um, I don't agree with the results of that evaluation and I'm requesting an independent educational evaluation. It's called an IEE. And what happens is the district will then pay for you to go and find your own professional to go okay. and re redo that same, to reevaluate that same concern. That also applies if you request a specific evaluation for a student. And they say, we don't have anyone on staff to do that. For example, a lot of times if someone needs an auditory um, evaluation, they don't usually have someone on staff to do that. So you can say, well, then I'm requesting an IEE for that. And then they will pay for you to find a professional to do that. There's one hiccup about IEEs, which is it has, there's a set rate that they're willing to, that they have to pay. It's a, there's a set rate. It's not just your school district, it's for the state. So you have to okay. find someone who will, who will, who will do the work for that rate. That's the, that's the only trick. And then the other, the other issue was, um, can you, uh, is there something else you can do? Um, yes, you can, uh, with that additional information with the evaluation, that would probably be more helpful to move the team, but if they still did not agree that okay. you know, the child was, has, is having an issue, there's, there's a, concern about the environment being appropriate for children, that whole least restrictive environment idea. Um, sometimes if the child can't work in that environment, then that is re too restrictive, right? It's not least restrictive. Um, okay. So they might need a, a different type of a classroom or a different school setting. Um, so that's, that's part of what could be discussed as well. And again, you can please call the Federation for one-on-one -on -one support. We're happy to help 
And those workshops, I think, to explain those kinds of rights, that understanding the IEP is the name of the, the one that I would recommend. Okay. But yeah, please, you can email me directly. By, I'll put my email in the chat again, too, which is okay. information on that that's helpful. Does that help? Does that help? Um, it, it does. Um, um, so would I, so if I call them to, cause I know everything's not one day, but I actually pulled her out of school. So she's not even attending school because, you know, so I don't, so should I send her back tomorrow and then just start working on emailing and calling and doing this and that or. That one I can't give you I would just offer lastly, David, we can uh, also you can, you can, yeah, an offer one item, second to our interpreters. One second. I'm so sorry. Talk you. I'm just going to pause this one second. Joshi, uh, all I was going to say to our last parent <laughs> on to the, the, the other questions. Uh, 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 BPS will be willing to the chat and connect with you online about that more specific issue. I team the channels are not on interpreter stop please. Thank you. Un momento. It's not a update at all. Yeah. Hold on. I fix I fixed it. I fixed it. One second. Okay, how do I got you? We had two interpreters sign off, so I have been unable to add that. I'm starting it now. All right, interpretation is back on. I'm so sorry, everyone. No, thank you for helping. Um, in the interest of time, I'm just going to pivot right away to the question I promised we'd get back to in the chat. Sarah, if you don't mind um, asking that question on behalf of the of the parent or guardian in the chat. Yes, this question came from Jasmine Madier. Um, she was asking, how do you go from sub-separate to inclusion? What kind of meeting would this require? Okay, great question. Do you want to take that for how it specifically happens in Boston? Because I know you have different folks in those roles. Yes, do we have, well, do we, does our, um, do we have anyone from our BPS team who would yeah. like absolutely thank you Kelsey hi good evening parents this is Kay Seal I'm your chief of specialized services and I just love the questions that you're asking tonight it shows that you really paid attention to the presentation that was done by the federation it was an excellent presentation so thank you Megan and your team for putting forward such an awesome presentation and thank you to our SPEDPAC board for coordinating this meeting because it's a meeting that all of our families need to get as much information as possible so that they can have the knowledge and the support that they need, especially not just our, our families who have students in IEPs, but also our families who have students in 504 plans. Um, in order for us, the question really talks about a child, you have a child who's in a substantially separate classroom, and the um, IEP team is considering, or you may be contacted because your child is making such great progress, to either reduce the services or consideration for inclusion. We are not moving students based on just having a conversation with our families. It's important that you understand that families need to be involved in this process. And this will include us making sure that we have parent permission, which is assigned consent, because when we're moving a student from a more restrictive placement, which is like a substantially separate classroom, and that means your child is getting all of his or her education within a specialized classroom, then we must have updated evaluations. We must have evidence, we must have data. We must also look at the progress that your child has made towards his or her goals and objectives. And that is all done through the IEP process. So we get permission for us to do updated evaluations, possibly in suspected area of disability, we look at the progress that your child has made on achieving his or her goals and objectives. And through that process, we then reconvene the team and it's a team decision. 
the IEP team makes a decision if there's going to be any changes to a, a child's IEP and parents are at that table part of the decision making. So that is a process not just in Boston, but it's a process that's mandated by the regulations um, that we follow very carefully. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Seal, for that. That was really helpful. Provide some more comprehensive information about that. And I know I speak for all of us when I say if there's more, again, actual, you know, follow up on a particular situation, we will be sure that you get to, you know, to the right person or people if, if you would like even additional information. Um, again, I'm moving quickly because I want to be sure we can get to as many questions as we can. Um, let me see. Celia is next. Celia, do you want to go ahead and unmute and ask your question? Hi, good afternoon. Um, so I have a question, um, actually a few concerns about my son's IEP. He goes to the Matterhunt in Mattapan. Um, so he's always had IEP for reading and math. So my first concern is that they took him off of math IEP. Um, I guess he was showing a little improvement in his last school to Chittick. He's now at the Matterhunt. Um, yeah, he's okay in math, but as the math is getting, you know, you know, more advanced. Zamir is struggling in math to the point where he's shutting down. Um, he, the teacher is not explaining to him slowly on the work. So he gets upset and um, he says, I asked the teacher, I raise my hand a lot and she just ignores me. So he don't, he just gets shut down. He emotional. A lot of times that I leave Zamir, um, pick Zamir up from the school, he's crying. Um, he's always complaining that, um, the kids always use, you know, smart remarks towards him about his weight, his color, things like that. So the school is becoming a big um, concern, like a problem. I'm not feeling comfortable with the school. I do have plans on transferring to me. He's in sixth grade. So I'm looking forward to the Taylor. I'm not too sure if I want to put him into a mix of high school just as yet, because he's literally, he's 11 years old. His reading is not there at all, he's spelling, it's not there. He's literally asks me to spell like second grade words, the way I stare at him like, Zamir, are you serious? So I got his um, his report card and the matter hunt pretty much, he was one grade off of a honor roll. How his teacher gives him a B in reading when he can't read. So it's, it's concerning, I'm like, you know what? He's not getting the education, the full support that he needs. He has a therapy also in his in his IEP. He hasn't been seeing the therapist. They will come once a week now. And if that, like today's Thursday, his therapist was supposed to see him, did not pick him up, picked up the next student. So as a man, he complains to me about it. Like, mommy, my therapist don't come see me. He doesn't pick me up. They don't give me the one-on-one, -on -one, like my old school. I transferred the mayor because I wanted him to be in a you know big of environment, um, the chick and then trust me, I I I know that it was the worst mistake. The the chick was more of a um history old colonial school old school didn't really have much of an experience of gym and all those other classes. To make it short, um, it was more of a emotional and academic support there. The man's not getting the the knowledge that he needs for his IEP in that school. I don't understand why his report card came back that way because he doesn't like to do his homework because he doesn't understand it. So I'm lost on that. I don't like the fact that he shut down and the teacher, I had multiple um, meetings with the teacher. I said, you know, Zamir says you explain it and he doesn't catch on as fast. You know, I have to work one-on-one -on -one Zamir for him to be okay. Once a man doesn't like to get anything wrong, if he doesn't understand, he's not going to want to do it. And he says, I always ask her for help. And she says, oh, you have to do it on your own. He doesn't know how to do it on his own. He's trying to have you break it down. So he needs the one-on-one -on -one math and reading. He's not getting it there at all. Thank you, Celia. I, that was, I'm sorry, this is so hard. I'm sorry to hear that you're struggling right now. It sounds like you have data to share with the team that you have information, both your child's information of like how he's reporting, how socially and emotionally he's feeling in this environment. 
and also you have data on the grades, like for what you're seeing and you can give the anecdotal information of like, when I read these types, he can't read this level word, but he can read this level word. So that's all data that you can bring back to the team. If the team is seeing it too, then there would be more, but you wouldn't need more evaluations, but if they don't see it, then you could request um, an evaluation based on this new data to see if, you know, from an abstract perspective, if they could quantify it, like what's going on. Um, and then that could, Create other changes, but I do want to let the Sped Pack acknowledge the school issue in terms of like being what I because I'm outside of Boston. Um, I, I don't want to try to speak to when you all change schools, when you don't, what what those options are, or how to navigate that particular school. So love for you guys I to wanted to take them out last year, but unfortunately, they didn't give them a ceremony for fifth graders until sixth grade, and I didn't know it, it went up to sixth grade. So, and it, last year was their first year of putting sixth grade. So I feel like the Matt Hunt, I had, I called the BPS. I feel like they trapped the kids. They didn't give them a, like, not a ceremony. Of course, they didn't graduate, but a certificate to say, here, you can go ahead and go to another school. They said, if you want to go to another school, we'll give you a transcript. Really? I find that very emotional. My son was, he cried last year because everybody, all his friends and other schools were recognized after they graduated or after, you know, after they completed the first from fifth grade and K-2. The Matterhunt don't recognize that at all. Just so you know, the only time you get recognized is when you pass the sixth grade, not K-2s, none of that. No, yeah, nothing. When you make no it to the last grade. I didn't like that. I wish I would have known because it took away history from where I put my, my, my kids stuff up. They don't have one. So I was like, I was very emotional. I cried the whole time from last year at, you know, ready to go on because I was preparing to get them ready. And they said, no, we don't do that. I said, whoa. So you guys have a lot of flags that I didn't know about. So the, from the first day, he was, it was a problem. The man never had a, like a behavioral problem. The, the variant that he's experiencing at that school unacceptable. I don't like it. Celia, I don't like it. I'm, glad, I, I'm, I'm not glad that you had to share that, but I'm glad that you had the courage to share it. And I'm, I want to encourage, and we'll certainly connect with you also, you know, offline, just because there's three minutes left to the meeting, but I want to make sure that those who are on here from BPS, you know, I know that they will make a commitment also to connect with you individually about all of the things you've mentioned, because you deserve answers and support and help. And of course, I wish we had nine more hours to go on this meeting alone, but will you, um, will you also, uh, you know, make sure that your contact information to the extent you're comfortable is in that chat, because we will absolutely, we as SpedPAC will follow up with you, but what I'll, I know that the, that BPS will, will get you to the right person who can help talk through each of these things. But I will say, I'm so glad that you spoke tonight as candidly, as honestly, and authentically, um, because I know it's about your child, but you spoke to the concerns that so many other people have. So thank you for doing that. Um, it is 8.28. We, I'm going to go back and, and, and we have time for one more question, if we can be super speedy about it. Edith, uh, I see your hand up. Um, go ahead and unmute. Thank you, Kelsey. I'll try to be quick. And I just want to thank um, thank you, Andrea, for your presentation. And thank you, Megan, for such valuable information. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm concerned that there seems to be an uptick in bullying in schools. And obviously, students with disabilities are more at risk. And the IEP calls for uh, the team to discuss this and put in protocols and supports for anti-bullying. And I'm talking about situations that are really quite serious. It seems that schools are not responding rapidly to these incidents of bullying. And oftentimes the student who is the target is the one who is reprimanded after they are bullied and defend themselves. There's no investigations. Uh, the parents are not met with. And what is especially disturbing is that the district and some schools are using peer mediation, which is exceedingly inappropriate and puts students at risk for more trauma. So uh, this question is for you, Casey, and I'm so happy that you're here. I really want to understand what the district is doing systemically and structurally 
to ensure that schools understand the Massachusetts anti-bullying law and they are following the steps and guidelines when there is an incident that is reported by a parent. Some schools are requiring the parents to write an email, but it should be verbal or written. And so what is, it, you know, I guess I have two questions. What is the district using for anti-bullying curriculum? Uh, because that is a requirement. And, and then secondly, what is the district doing to address bullying so that the target is safe, but also the bully gets intervention? Because if you don't help the students have, who are bullying, who are often coming from trauma situations as well, then you, you're not going to solve this problem. So I really want to know what specifically the district is doing proactively, preventive, preventively, preventatively, and also what happens when the actual incident happens. What's the protocols that the district is using? Thank you so much. Thanks, Edith. That, that's a very rich and long question, Edith. So I will try to give you as much information as I can um, based on um, my involvement in this process. As you all know, all of our school leaders and administrators are involved in uh, significant um, workshops in regards to following the procedures and regulations in regards to bullying. I do know that one of the practices that the district does have is restorative justice. Um, I also know that there's been training and guidance, especially around following the process that bullying in terms of making sure that we, if a parent has shared some concerns or a uh, educational surrogate parent and or a caretaker that they feel that their child or even a student that they feel that their child is um, being harassed or bullied, the first thing our school leaders need to do is to take that seriously and they do and they should start that investigation process. Um, as they go through that investigation process and it may involve interviewing, um, making sure that they've done some observations, interviewing um, the child themselves and or any um, other person that might be involved in that process is get as much information as well as the teachers. And of course, they need to reach out to that parent and guardian immediately to let them know. Um, we also know that in some instances where there is um, evidence that there's this is an ongoing concern, and if we do have a student that's on a 504 plan or an IEP, we also know that we must also reconvene the team. Um, to address whether or not if there's any supports that needs to be put in place um, to make sure that our students are safe. Um, there's ongoing guidance as well through MAC, as well as their great support. We also have operational leaders within our schools that work with our school-based teams. Um, we will gladly provide some information and some resources. Um, we know that this is a, a systemic and it's a problem across the nation um, for our students. And we're taking it very seriously. And I think what we could do at another point in time is provide more detailed information. Um, maybe it's through our SPED pack process or online to kind of assist you in answering some further in more detail, some more technical assistance in terms of what the district is currently doing. Um, and that really stems from working closely with our regional superintendents as well as our school leaders. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Chief Seal for that answer. I want to quickly thank everyone again. First and foremost, our speakers from the Federation, Megan, Andrea, Anne. Uh, that was amazing, comprehensive. And of course, to district leaders who came and offered their support. And mostly and always, thanks to all of our members for being here, sharing your concerns, but also highlighting for one another and the greater membership what are the challenges we all face and we are stronger for facing them together. So I promise you, you are not alone. Um, we're here for you and you're here for each other. So we'll see you next time. Please again, revisit in the newsletter, the details about um, any interest in board positions and we will see you next time. Have a really lovely night.